This is American History TV's Lectures in History podcast. This week, a class on the new roles U.S. women assumed in the workforce and politics during the late 19th century. Taught by Boston College professor Heather Cox Richardson. This episode was recorded in 2016. Let's go ahead and start. As you know, the theme of this course comes from the idea that the Civil War dramatically changes American history because what it really does is it destroys everything everybody believed about the relationship between America and the American government. So once the war is over, and this is actually a really good day to talk about this because, of course, today is the anniversary of the firing on Fort Sumter. Um, Everybody has different ideas about what the nation is supposed to become, and we've really gone through a lot of that with the idea that African-American men who'd fought for the Union had some ideas about what America should be, and certainly white Southerners had ideas about what America should be. The Northerners who won the war had ideas about what America should be. The Indians and the Chinese who were out west had ideas about what America should be. And certainly the northern men who had fought and won the war had ideas about what the country should be. But the critical question as to what it was going to be was who was going to have a say in it. And we've gone through that as well. But who had a say in what that new nation was going to be was going to have a dramatic effect on what it eventually became. So today I want to talk about women and women's lives in the late 19th century and their role in what was really the reconstruction, the true rebuilding of the North, the South, and the West into a new nation in the wake of the Civil War. And the story of women is way more crucial to that story than most people realize. Most people, when they think about women's rights and women's roles in America, start here, and you probably know about this from your high school days, with the Seneca Falls Convention of 1848. Uh, When a number of women came together, women and men as well, came together in Seneca Falls, New York, to talk about women's rights. And the idea of rights for women came out of the abolitionist movement, especially in 1840, when a number of female abolitionists went to London for the first world's anti-slavery convention. And while they were there to speak about human rights, those women were not allowed to speak. They had to sit in the gallery and they weren't allowed to talk. So on the way home, uh, a number of them get talking and they say, this is not right. That if really people are supposed to be free and equal, that women should have rights as well. And out of that comes the organization of the Seneca Falls Convention in 1848. And this is the group of people who issue the Declaration of Sentiments, which is based on the Declaration of Independence, but calls for rights for women and tries to fight back against what they considered the oppression of men. You all learn about this, and everybody talks about this being the beginning of women's rights in America, and it is. It's a very important symbolic moment But essentially, after 1848, with the Declaration of Sentiments and the Seneca Falls Convention, nothing happens. This happens in New York. New York's got a lot of other things going on. They're fighting a a, a battle over property rights in New York. There's a lot of things going on in the East, especially in the Northeast in the 1840s and the 1850s. And one person looks at the Seneca Falls Convention and says, you know, It's almost as if, uh, you know, we're talking about Martians uh, voting and having rights. It's just not on people's radar screens at a national level. And and not a lot of changes after the Declaration of Sentiments. The real change for women and for women's rights comes not out of the Declaration of Sentiments in 1848, but rather out of the American Civil War. And we've talked some in this class about that. Women's roles changed during the Civil War dramatically. So they go into the war both in the North and the South, believing that they are going to be able really to maintain the roles that they had before the Civil War. And that breaks down almost immediately. You know, they start with the idea that they're going to be help meets, if you will, and very quickly women have to take over a whole new set of roles during the Civil War. So first of all, they, um, they begin by supporting the troops, and both in the North and the South, and especially in the North, that quickly becomes taking on very public roles. Now, women in the North had had public roles before because of the abolitionist movement and because that had gotten them to some degree into politics. But during the Civil War, the roles of women really take on new dimensions. So we have, for example, women working um, in the new government jobs. When I talked about the creation of American money, somebody actually physically had to take those large plates of paper and cut them into bills. And those were women. Those were government girls who did the cutting. 
And actually, if you look at these now, and sometimes you see them in museums, or you can even buy them on the internet, if you look at the <coughs> edges, you can tell when the, when the women were cutting them, because by the end of the day, they got tired, and the edges aren't straight. Um, if you collect them, you want the ones with the straight edges. So women are working in the government. They're beginning to work as clerks. In the northern fields, fields, they're taking over for the men folk who've gone off to war. They're working in factories in both the north and the south. And they begin to do uh, a number of things that are not usually part of women's roles. So for example, we have women getting involved in nursing, which had always been a male, considered sort of a dirty male profession. You get women involved in nursing, and this is the point at which nursing becomes a female rather than a male profession. This is the beginning of the switch to that. As men go off to war, you get women involved in teaching. Again, it had always been a male profession. It becomes a pink collar profession during the Civil War simply because the women are the ones who are there to do the teaching. You have women, when they are nursing, going into spaces where they had previously been excluded. You know, you didn't used to want your daughters to be in a hospital which is dirty and full of men in various stages of undress who are um, messy, you know, they're dying or they're bleeding. And these are spaces that women begin to enter. You also have women buying bonds that I talked about. So for the first time in American history, women literally own a piece of the American government. They're buying the bonds on which the government and the military depends. And of course, they're sending their sons and their husbands off to fight this war. So women have invested really, really heavily in the U.S. government. They, they are part of that U.S. government. They've supported it with their money. They've supported it with their lives. They've supported it with their sons. They've supported it with their efforts. And some of them quite literally put the, their lives on the line for the U.S. government. We have Civil War spies, and we have even a few women fighting as Civil War soldiers. And there's a great story about that, a woman who is discovered only late, many years later when she applies for a pension and is able to prove that, in fact, she fought during the Civil War. There aren't many of them, but they're a great story. So you have women, especially in the North, coming out of this war believing that they should have a say in that government. They gave everything for that government. They feel like they should have a say in what happens. Certainly more of a say than those white Southerners that Andrew Johnson was pardoning at such an extraordinary rate during the summer of 1865. So that by the fall of 1865, all but about 1,500 of the former Confederates had received presidential pardons or had been part of that blanket proclamation. And they look at that and they're like, wait a minute, wait a minute, how come these guys who picked up guns and tried to destroy the US government have a say and we don't. And you're going to see a similar pattern, incidentally, after World War II, when you, it's no coincidence that you get the women's, the second wave of women's activism after World War II out of a very similar set of circumstances. So what happens is coming out of the war, um, women expect that they're going to be able to have a say in this new reconstructed government. And that, of course, is not what happens. What happens is coming out of the war, the focus is, for various reasons, as we've talked about, is on African-American male suffrage. And especially women suffragists look at this, and they're willing to let that happen, but they also expect that they're going to be included as well. And a woman you're going to hear more from me about, and you've already heard from me about, Julia Ward Howe, put it this way. She said, when we are writing that 14th Amendment, women should be included. If we're talking about citizenship and we're talking about having a say in American society, women belong in that amendment. They should have rights under that amendment. And of course, when Congress is discussing the 14th Amendment at great length, Congress, some congressmen actually do introduce the idea that women should be included in the 14th Amendment and that women should be considered full citizens with a say in American society. And they're laughed down. Uh, the idea that somehow women should have rights and should be able to uh, participate in American society is a, just a non-starter in 1868. And this, to suffragists, especially those who had worked so hard for the war, just really stung. Julia Ward Howe said, The Civil War came to an end, leaving the slave not only emancipated, but endowed with the full dignity of citizenship. 
The women of the North had greatly helped to open the door which admitted him to freedom and it safeguard the ballot. Was this door to be shut in their face? And in 1868, when that door was shut in their face, two really dramatic things happen. Two suffrage associations form in America. Now, most of you know from your textbooks that the, these organizations joined together in 1890. And most people who look at the advance of women's suffrage across the country really look at that 1890 merger as being crucial. And yet, these things come out of the 14th Amendment. They come out of the idea that if African American men should be included in American citizenship, so should women. So should white women as the people that these women primarily are concerned with. But women should have a say in American society. So what happens is first the National Woman Suffrage Association forms. And these are women like Elizabeth Cady Stanton and Susan B. Anthony who were very active in the abolitionist movement. And they tend to be more radical. They want a wide number of reforms for American women that are going to level the playing field between men and women with property ownership, divorce laws, um, the, the different economic uh, inequalities between the sexes. And they are seen really as, as radicals. Three months later, you get the organization of the American Woman Suffrage Association. And that's a much more moderate group. And it's an interesting group for my purposes today because it's formed primarily by Lucy Stone and Julia Ward Howe. And Lucy Stone and Julia Ward Howe demanded only the vote with the idea that once you get the vote, you have a say in your government and you can change the laws if you don't like the laws. Now, this is always the part where I want to talk a little bit about Julia Ward Howe. Uh, Julia Ward Howe uh, is the same woman who wrote the Battle Hymn of the Republic in 1862. I've talked to you about her before. She been, begins to take on a much more public role during the Civil War, uh, especially through her writing. She's actually a brilliant thinker. Her diaries are at Harvard. And she is, uh, she becomes involved in the American Woman Suffrage Association because she really wants the vote. Now, she's a much more moderate character than, say, um, Elizabeth Cady Stanton. And she wants the vote for this reason. Her husband is abusive. And every time she wants to leave him, he says, great, go. You'll never see your kids again. And she, in, it, because in this era, children are the property of their fathers. And if women uh, divorce their husbands, in fact, they can be kept from the kids. So she stays married to him, and she tries to continue to have access to the kids. And the great part of this story is he's really awful to her. I read through her diaries a few years ago. Uh, he's really awful to her, and he keeps trying to get her to destroy the diaries, and he keeps telling her she's stupid and nobody's going to listen to her, and, and she doesn't matter, and that he's really the shining light in the, the couple because he's a very famous reformer. And I always try to make a point to talk about her and this situation because I want you all to leave this room and for the rest of your lives to remember that Julia Ward Howe is an incredibly important thinker, writer. You're going to hear more about her in a minute. And she was married to some jerk nobody remembers. That's my part for her. All right, so what happens after the organization of these two suffrage groups to try and push for women to have a say in American society. Well, this is the era right after the Civil War when legislators are trying to create a world in which equal rights really is the <coughs> underpinning of the American government. So this is the period when people are talking about everybody having equal rights. Everybody should have a say in American society, and they're really trying to expand that with, as I say, the 14th Amendment, which theoretically includes everybody except Indians not taxed. Um, that's an important caveat, an important exception. But out west, unlike where Seneca Falls took place in New York, out west in the organization of those territories that I talked about during the war, those territories that come in the west so quickly, the idea of women's suffrage takes off. In 1869, in Wyoming Territory, Wyoming Territory gives women the vote uh, when they put together their uh, constitution. There are very few women in Wyoming Territory, I promise you. 
Um, but it gives women the vote with the idea that in these new Western territories, women should have the right to have a say in the construction of that society. Takes off. The next year, in 1870, Utah gives women the vote. It's about 1,000 women in Wyoming. There's about 17,000 in Utah. And they give women the vote in Utah in 1870 because there is a referendum coming up on whether or not polygamy should be included in the state laws. And the expectation of the legislators who include the women is that women will vote against polygamy. That by opening up the vote, you're going to move society forward. And of course, women will vote against polygamy. And women go to the polls in, Wyoming, uh, in Utah, and they vote in favor of polygamy. That stops the spread of women's suffrage across the West dead for, for years and years and years. The idea that somehow expanding the vote is going to create a better society hits real trouble when it hits Utah and women vote in a way that most of the people who gave them the vote thought that they would not. So this is going to change the idea of women's suffrage spreading state by state, especially through the, the West in the early 1870s. Still, if you look at that date, women have hope because in, the eight, in 1870, Congress is going to be debating a new constitutional amendment to protect African American voting in the South, and that's the 15th Amendment. And you know about the 15th Amendment. It's the one that protects, uh, protects uh, voting. Women lobby hard to be included in the 15th Amendment. Uh, when Congress passes and then the states ratify that amendment in 1870, women are not included. When they are not included, uh, suffragists are furious. And they do something very smart. They decide that what they're going to do is they're not going to try and lobby any longer for women's suffrage specifically. What they're going to do is they're going to argue that they are citizens under the 14th Amendment because, of course, they've either been born in America or naturalized in America. <coughs> so women decide in the presidential election, the tight presidential election of 1872, women decide that they are going to test their right to vote under the 14th Amendment. And across the country in 1872, suffragists try to vote. They try to register to vote. And what that means is they will go up uh, to a registrar and have their names enrolled, it's called, and be able to cast a ballot or not. And in 1872, across the country, they try and do that, and, and some of them succeed. Uh, others do not. And there's a really important court case I want you to remember, and that is, uh, starts in Missouri. And as you remember, Missouri is kind of a mess of a state because it was so evenly divided between Confederates and Unionists, and they've got that 1865 Constitution that prohibits Democrats from voting, being lawyers, being doctors, being ministers, all those things. So who gets to vote and how the government is going to work in Missouri is really a crucial spot in the country. And in 1872, a woman named Virginia Minor tries to register, register to vote under this idea that she should be able to vote under the 14th Amendment. And she goes to the registrar, and the guy who is at the registrar is a guy named Happerset. And she goes and tries to register to vote, and Happerset refuses to let her register. She sues him. And the case Minor v. Happerset, Minor versus Happerset, is going to work its way through the courts, and it's going to be decided by the Supreme Court in 1875. And I'll tell you about that in a minute. But the one you've heard about in this year, uh, in the year of 1872, without probably putting in context, is that Susan B. Anthony does register to vote. She registers to vote in New York, and she actually casts a ballot in that election. But after she casts a ballot, she is arrested for the crime of voting. And that's kind of an interesting concept to get your head around, the crime of voting. And the argument about it being a crime to vote, actually, interestingly enough, they get her under the enforcement acts that were put in place to protect African American voting in the South. But the, the crime of voting, the argument behind that is that if people who should not have a right to have a say in American society vote, they're diluting the votes of those people who do have a right to vote. 
So by the time she is arrested in 1872 for voting, Susan B. Anthony is a very well-known figure. This is a, a very public case, and she is very public about it. After she's arrested and then um, let out on bail, there's a story behind that, but after that happens, she actually goes around her region of New York giving a number of speeches about the fact she's been arrested for the crime of voting. Uh, and in the trial, uh, the trial just adds fuel to the fire. Because in the trial, what happens is Susan B. Anthony is the only woman in the courtroom. She is not allowed to testify on her own behalf because she's a woman. And after her lawyer and the, the uh, prosecuting attorney present their cases, uh, the judge simply reads the decision he had already written before the trial. And uh, in, a, in a wonderful moment, her, um, she, she watches this happen, and she gets up and answers him, and she won't shut up. And he says, you need to sit down now. That's enough. You need to stop. And she's like, no, I'm not going to. And she tells him exactly what she thinks of him. But it's become such a, a powerful cause as she's giving these speeches about what happened that um, it becomes sort of a, a flashpoint where people look at the question of who really should have a say in American society. And one of the things that Anthony says as she's speaking across New York is this. She's so mad at what happened, she says, this government is not a republic. It is an odious aristocracy, a hateful oligarchy of sex. Now, this often is mispunctuated when you see it in other places. So pay attention to how this is actually punctuated the right way. She says, an oligarchy of wealth where the rich govern the poor, an oligarchy of learning where the educated govern the ignorant, or even an oligarchy of race where the Saxon rules the African might be endured. She's actually okay with the idea of rich people governing the poor, uh, educated people governing the uneducated, even white people governing black people, but this oligarchy of sex carries dissension, discord, and rebellion into every home of the nation. Well, this should sound really familiar to you guys because this is 1872 when many people, especially in the North, are turning against the idea of laborers having a say in American society. So what you're seeing here is once again the, the, the switch from the idea that everybody should have a say in American society to the idea that's developing in the 1870s and that we've talked about some in the 1880s that in fact maybe not everybody should have a say in American society. And the question after the 1870s is where do you draw the boundaries and how do you draw the boundaries? And women's roles in this is going to be crucial to drawing the boundaries. All right, so what happens? In 1875, Congress, I'm sorry, the Supreme Court hands down the Minor v. Happersett decision. And when you read that uh, for this week, read my version of it because it's a very long, kind of boring decision until the very end of it. They, they go through everything they can think of that women have done in American history. And they say, you know, the question at hand is are women citizens? And they, they say, oh, they did this and they did this and they did this and they did this and they did this. And yes, of course, they're citizens. But then there's a kicker at the end of it. And the kicker at the end of it is they say, of course, women are citizens. But citizenship does not necessarily convey the right to vote. This is a really big deal. Because with this decision, the Supreme Court unhinges citizenship and voting. Remember, this is Reconstruction. And this is 1875. And in 1876, you're going to have attacks on black voting across the South that returns the southern states to the control of white Democrats. The idea of women voting is intimately connected to the question of who should have a say in American society, who is a good member of society, and who should have a right to participate in the construction of that new nation and the government that rules that nation. Meanwhile, if this is the 
philosophical argument about who should have a say in American society. Women are not sitting home eating bonbons waiting for this to play out. Because with the loss of so many men during the Civil War and the dramatic change in the economy that we talked about, the rise of uh, industry, women in factories, the changing agriculture, the push west, the rise of cities. Women's roles changed dramatically in the late 19th century at the very moment when you've got men moving to the cities and moving out west and dying in huge numbers, as well as coming back to their homes from the war crippled, either in body or in mind. And those things open up entire new realms of opportunity for women both in the North and the South and African American women and white women as well as immigrant women. I've talked to you before about Edmonia Lewis, but she's a great example of somebody for whom the late 19th century, especially the post-war years, opens up a lot of doors. She's the woman who I mentioned before shows up in the um, Chicago ex uh, Exposition of 1893. Edmonia Lewis is obviously one of our uh, most famous American sculptors. She was educated at Oberlin uh, College at the time. She is African American and Indian. And she, especially after the Civil War, became for many Americans a symbol of human rights. The idea that this extraordinarily talented woman happened to come in an African American and Indian skin to many people seemed unimportant compared to her talent. Not to everybody, I have to say. But because she is so visible, because she is so popular, she becomes a symbol of what women can do, what all women can do. She gets a lot of her training actually in Rome because there the prejudices are not as strong as they are in America. So she gets a lot more opportunity there and a lot more training there and becomes very famous in Rome. By 1873, when I say she's a well-known sculptor, as you know, when you, um, an agriculturalist, a farmer in, the, the, in this period, let's say made a dollar a day, ballpark, not a lot of money, a good living, 300 to $500 a year in that money. Um, in 1873, she had two commissions. Those two commissions were worth $50,000 each. Yeah, huh? Uh, in 1877, she was the sculptor Ulysses S. Grant chose to, to make his bust, and he was very pleased with what she had done. She uh, is obviously very well known and opening up the door to women in the arts. Uh, and one of the things she does is she sculpts, this is her Minnehaha from 1868, she puts almost a, a, a neoclassical look on Americans, especially American women, especially American women of color. So her Minnehaha is very famous, but perhaps even more famous is this statue of 1860 seven called Forever Free. And she's doing a lot with this sculpture here. You can see her main character standing has chains on. The chains are broken, but they are not off, which is interesting. But for our purposes today, one of the things that is more interesting is that the man in this sculpture is unclothed, but the woman is clothed, which is a real reversal of the idea of African American women as being um, uh, somehow objects that are not um, that are not that are not bounded. She is she's dressed. She is, if you will, taking part in society in a way that he, without clothes, is doing less of. It's a it's sort of a, a, the protected woman and the idea that she can carry um, she can carry herself forward into modern American society. Uh, even though he's bigger and more powerful, and even though she's at his feet, there's a lot going on in that particular statue. But you're looking at this and you're thinking, okay, Edm Edmonia Lewis, never heard of her. My life was complete without hearing about her. It actually wasn't. Because she is only one of the women in the late 19th century who dramatically changed American culture after the Civil War. So she's a sculptor. But here's a woman I would lay money none of you have ever heard of. Her name is Augusta Jane Evans. She is a Southern novelist after the Civil War. And she is the first female American author to earn more than $100,000. Uh, she is, she precedes Edith Wharton, of course, but the reason that she is important and the reason I bring her up is because I've talked a lot about the North so far today, 
Southern women are in an especially uh, pinched spot, if you will. They're from a region of the country that has just lost the Civil War and that, as I've talked about, is devastated, economically and psychologically as well. And the men, especially the white men returning home, are often um, really unable to assume positions in society again. So you've got a bunch of women who are financially dependent. They've got to find some way to make money. And they know they're living through a dramatic time in, the, in America. And they're talented and they're educated. So coming out of the Civil War, you have a huge number of female writers, North and South, but primarily in the South. And what they write are things that now don't make it across our radar screen very often, but she is famous as a romance novelist. And the Southern women especially worked out a lot of the tensions between the North and the South through romance novels and through um, the explorations you could do with romance novels of boundaries, of gender, of economics, of race, a whole lot of these things, and they're really really interesting. You can see some of the ideas of that picked up when we read The Virginian, which is, does a lot of things, obviously, when we read that, but also, and it's about the West mostly, but he is definitely tying into the incredible popularity of post-Civil War romance novels. But this lady may be more familiar to you. This is Louisa May Alcott. Her 1868 novel, Little Women, uh, was the bestseller in that year. It sold 35,000 copies in its first year. Uh, she really pioneers the way for northern female writers. Uh, she actually didn't like writing these books, but they become enormously popular. And one of the reasons they become enormously popular is because her Little Women of 1868 explores a whole bunch of new roles for women. How many of you have read that book? Um, if you think about it, then there's four girls in Little Women, and only one of them is a traditional stay-at-home pre-Civil War girl, and that's Beth. And Beth finally dies of some unspecified illness while she's still living at home with her parents, dropping mittens out the window. I'm um, sorry, I'm making a little bit of fun, but Beth is kind of a homebody. She doesn't, she doesn't like to leave the, the house. The other sisters are all modern women, if you will. Meg is a governess. She works for a living. Doesn't like it all the time, but she works for a living. Jo is a writer and wants to, um, wants to go out and write the great American novel. And Amy is a sculptor. And all three of them are actually fairly successful in those professions. But crucially, all three of them end up settling down, getting married, and having children. And that's going to be important for the way that women reintegrate into this new reconstructed society. So you've got Southern writers, you've got Northern writers. And by the way, Louise <coughs> May Alcott, we found out, oh, probably 20 years ago now, that she also wrote real potboiler stories, which she denigrates in, in Little Women. Um, because they paid better and she preferred them. She wrote a, a short story called Mask about how women had to sort of hide themselves That's that people only discovered fairly recently. Interesting stuff. But, but people aren't just reading about women. They're watching them. This is Anna Dickinson. She is so well known as a speaker. She is the first American woman to address Congress. 1864, very, very well known, very highly paid, eloquent speaker, and she speaks across the country at lectures where she introduces topics and tells people about subjects they didn't otherwise know about. So now women are not only taking part in the arts, showing their work, they are actually physically in public informing people. They're taking up public roles after the Civil War in a way that really they didn't do before the Civil War. So they're very visible. And they're also using that visibility to influence American life. Um, here's Julia Ward Howe again. I told you she'd come back to haunt us today. Julia Ward Howe increasingly focused on her position as a mother, which is, of course, what's driving her support for suffrage. Her position as a mother to say that women are different than men, 
that women really can do society better than men have done. And what really sets her off is not only did she live through the Civil War and watch the incredible carnage of the war. Remember, she's in Washington in 60, uh, at the end of 61, seeing the circling fires around Washington, seeing uh, you know, one of her friends, one of the first people killed in the war. After the Franco-Prussian War, uh, which was just this incredibly bloody war, she decided that enough was enough and that women really had to take over world society. She said in her reminiscences after the Franco-Prussian War, I was visited by a sudden feeling of the cruel and unnecessary character of the contest. It seemed to me a return to barbarism, the issue having been one which might easily have been settled without bloodshed. The question forced itself upon me, why don't the mothers of mankind interfere in these matters to prevent the waste of that human life of which they alone know and bear the cost. So what she does is she issues an appeal to womanhood throughout the world. And she writes to women, uh, she says throughout the world, but it's women t with whom she has contact in other countries. And she says, we need to stop war. And she makes this declaration that says, we will not have great questions decided by irrelevant agencies. Our husbands shall not come to us reeking with carnage for caresses and applause. Our sons shall not be taken from us to unlearn all that we have been able to teach them of charity, mercy, and patience. We, women of one country, will be too tender of those of another country to allow our sons to be trained to injure theirs. So this is the idea that women can take on even something like war and stop war if they are willing to exercise their roles as women and as women in politics. But while we're on this, this, the idea of joining the women together in meetings, <coughs> Cameron knows where this is going, becomes Mother's Days, where mothers, plural, come together to stop war. If you Google Mother's Day, it will tell you it started by Anna Jarvis in 18, 1908. That's wrong. Anna Jarvis starts it because she remembered her mother going to these Mother's Days. And this was her attempt to, to turn it into a day for her, or personally, for her mother. But the idea of Mother's Day comes straight out of this post-Civil War period with the idea that women, as mothers could clean up world politics. Isn't that cool? This is where we get Mother's Days then. But this idea of women taking, on, on, taking a, a role, and taking a role because they're different, starts really to take off in the 1870s. So in the 1860s, right up through um, 1870, you get the idea that women should have rights because all humans should have rights. But during the 1870s, you get the growth of this idea that women should have rights because they're different. Because women have a perspective that is going to be able to do things like stop war and stop the dangerous aspects of industrialization. So in 1874, we get the creation of the Women's Christian Temperance Union, the WCTU. Uh, instantly, they became politically involved. Um, they organized under um, Annie Wittenmeyer, they become politically uh, active because what they are trying to do is they're trying to stop excessive drinking. They're trying to promote temperance. And many cities have theoretically, uh, theoretically saloons are being uh, regulated, but they're really not. And they're intimately involved in the political system. So the WCTU begins to do things like pour liquor into the sewers or into the, it's actually not a sewer at the, in 74, it's going to be a much later picture because sewers don't really take off until the 1880s. But um, 
But they're actively trying to clean up the cities by getting rid of alcohol, and the WCTU becomes incredibly powerful. So I'm going to talk in a second about the Constitutional Convention of Idaho in 1889, and literally when the, the guys are trying to organize the Constitution, within days, they're still basically figuring out who's supposed to sit in what seat. The first people through the door are the WCTU, saying, out here in Idaho, we can't have alcohol. And they're there before anybody else shows up. And that's one of the first things that goes onto that agenda, because the WCTU is so, uh, so very powerful and so very popular. Well, women are not only taking roles in society in uh, sort of in atomized ways. Because women have entered the teaching professions, and because women have entered nursing. And because, as I talked about, we've got the rise of middle managers who now have extra money and leisure time, you have the concept coming that women need educations. What I want to talk about now is the rise of women's colleges, because women's colleges are going to be crucial for the late 19th century. And while women have had seminaries and have had educations before this period, People really point to the organization of Smith College in 1875 as a real landmark for the education of women. And Radcliffe is going to organize, the Radcliffe Annex, as it is known, is going to organize in 1879. Um, Radcliffe's going to be a little bit different than Smith because it actually borrows professors from Harvard. It's known as the Radcliffe Annex. Uh, Smith actually has its own professors. And what these colleges are doing is they are setting up women they're recognizing that women have brains, and they're educating women. But there's a funny twist to it, because they have to overcome the idea that women are weak vessels who you know, are going to be injured by the application of their brains, that they're going to turn into you know, sort of stoop-shouldered, bespectacled people who you know, can't do a hard day's work. So at the same time that women's colleges are actually quite aggressive about teaching women many of the same um, curricula that men have, women also have to take physical education classes. They have to walk. They have to learn how to have the womanly graces. Some, uh, some universe, uh, colleges, I'm sorry, not universities, have uh, courses in setting tables. Uh, in serving tea, in knowing where the different places for dishes go, so that women will not be educated out of their sphere, that they'll be able to be good wives and mothers, even though they can also read Greek. So there's a funny hybrid, and if anybody's interested in this, one of the things that comes out of the rise of the college movement that I think is fascinating, and you can see it in the later Louisa May Alcott books, is there's a whole series of novels and novelists that come from the 1870s on that write novels about women's colleges. So you get a whole series called the Betty Wales series, uh, where it's set in a women's college. Some of you may have read Daddy Longlegs, which is actually set in the uh, 20th century. There's a famous Fred Astaire movie called Daddy Longlegs, but kind of misses the point of it being a women's college. Um, there's a whole series of people who take on this idea, and women, girls, read them avidly. And you see this in the, in the late Louisa May Alcott books when uh, Joe and her husband, Professor Bear, start a women's college. And there's a wonderful scene in one of those books where the women, and eventually it becomes a co-ed college, uh, the women and the men sit on a staircase and discuss the uses of women's education. So if anybody's interested, that's there. But while women are learning these things, and these tend to be middle class women whose families have the money and the time to pull their women, their girls out of the workforce and send them to school, What's really crucial about these things is they're going to create a body of educated, intelligent, connected women. Women begin to form social networks in these colleges the same way I keep saying to you, your, your networks from school are going to matter in your lives. So women coming through these colleges are going to have friends. They're going to have friends they took classes with. They're going to have friends they sat up late talking about social issues with. And these networks are going to have a huge effect on the rest of American society, both in terms of what they do, but also the way they think about what they do. And one of the uh, people who is crucial in this is this woman here, Jane Addams. Now, it's worth mentioning, by the way, that by 1870, so many women are getting involved in education that by 1870, the majority of people graduating from high school in America are women. 
that early, women are the majority of high school graduates. Only about 2% of Americans go to college in that year, but women are already 21% of that group. So this is not just a few people. Jane Addams is from Illinois. Her father had worked with Abraham Lincoln. Um, <coughs> And she was always famous, incidentally, in her life for those eyes, uh, which were supposed, they were blue, and they were supposed to, you were supposed to basically sink into those eyes. Pretty much anybody who, I'll show you a picture of her later in a minute, pretty much anybody who saw Jane Addams commented on her eyes. Um, but Jane Addams did a tour of Europe when she was a young woman after going to a seminary, not to Smith or Radcliffe, but to a seminary, and uh, a, a, small, a small woman's college and was horrified by what she saw in Europe because she toured the tenement districts in London and she felt that the people she saw there were hardly even people. She actually likened them to animals. And she said, this is not right. This is the modern world because of course it was the modern world to her. And there is no way in a modern world that people should live like this. But exactly what one could do about it was not clear. Uh, she eventually does what one would expect. She turns to her social networks to a woman named Ellen Gates Starr, and the two of them begin to talk about how women can have an effect on the terrible conditions created by the urbanization and the industrialization of America rather than Europe. Because I've shown you pictures here, this is uh, uh, boys from Five Points, and Five Points, again, one of these great pictures. Uh, Five Points is the region of New York, the area of New York that's famous in um, uh, Gangs of New York. Uh, it's famous as being sort of a, the most dangerous part of New York. Here's another image of Five Points. So the question is, what can sort of sheltered, middle-class, usually white, not always, but usually white women do to ameliorate this sort of conditions. When they can't vote, they're not involved in, in the economy. What can they do to stop America from going down this road that we've talked about where there's very rich and very poor and everything seems to be falling apart? And the answer is that women see the world differently. They see the world organically. The idea that the way women can heal this split, if you will, is to return the idea of an organic society to America. And the way they can do it, I mean, it's one thing to talk about it, right? But the way they can do it is literally by living in these areas. So in 1889, Starr and Adams buy what becomes known as Hull House. It's in uh, a poor district of Chicago, they're in Chicago, and they begin, they open it, and they live there. You know, they don't say this is nasty and we're not going to live, they actually live there, and they begin to open services for the, the immigrants, it's an immigrant community, the immigrants around them. They begin to provide babysitting, they begin to... Um, talk to people about why their lives are the way they are. They try and clean the, the debris out of the cities, out of the, the trash, out of the streets, they, uh, and the garbage especially because they notice that the garbage is carrying flies and the flies, uh, the areas that have the worst garbage have the most sickness among babies. They take in unwed mothers. They try and provide social services. And crucially, because of those social networks I talked about, lots of middle class women, lots of educated middle class women come through Hull House and later on the Henry Street Settlement started in New York by Lillian Wald. And I'll talk about that in a minute. But they come through Hull House and they start to listen to the immigrants and the poor people around them about why they're poor, about what their lives are like. And they begin really to value those immigrants and the immigrant experiences. So they start to focus on the old world traditions that are still in America. They have presentations of needleworkers, for example, from countries where the women are really famous needleworkers. They try and encourage the daughters of these immigrant women to value their mother's experiences. And crucially, when they are trying to figure out why this, the, the, the cities are the way they are, these educated women go out and they collect statistics. They, they go into factories. 
They find out what people are paid. They find out how many hours they work. They find out what the work is like. They ask questions. They compile charts. And this is the beginning of social work. It was not an accident that the University of Chicago in the early 20th century was the place one went to study social work because this is where the idea had come from. Crucially for historians, these documents that these women collected are invaluable. And they are invaluable in the early 20th century when the Supreme Court starts to take into consideration conditions of life to make Supreme Court decisions. So, for example, in the Brandeis brief, Brandeis, when he writes the Brandeis brief, which puts together a whole bunch of uh, information about conditions um, in the country, uh, he actually cribs the material from his sister-in-law, who was a settlement house worker. These were called settlement houses. So the settlement house workers, like those at Hull House and those at the Henry Street settlement, begin to try and recreate an organic society, and they try to do it in a modern way by gra gathering statistics and ideas. And crucially, Lillian Wald brings to this table nursing skills. She is the one, uh, Jane Addams really brings political skills and social skills, if you will. Lillian Wald brings nursing skills, and she says we really need to improve public health. And she is the driving force behind getting nurses into schools, and behind improving public health across the country in general. Uh, here I told you I was going to show you an ex another picture of Jane Addams older. This is Jane Addams speaking to a number of children and again trying to improve the lives of women. This is a New York picture even though Jane Addams is from Chicago, but I like this image because this is what the settlement house workers are really trying to address. Women and children primarily, but you cannot improve the lives of women and children without improving society as a whole. But they don't stop here. This woman, Florence Kelly, is actually the daughter of a very famous industrialist uh, congressman from Pennsylvania, a guy named Pig Iron Kelly who was very important during the Civil War. And if anybody's interested, I always liked Pig Iron because he was not necessarily the brightest crayon in the box. But what he was really good at was listening to what everybody else said. So if you wanted to know what people thought and you're in a hurry in the Civil War, you can just read Pig Iron because he sort of synopsizes what everybody says. But what this means is he's very involved in the Republican Party and he's very involved in industrialization. And then he has this daughter. And she's got... Uh, issues of her own uh, that she wants to address in American society. She had been at Hull House. She had seen the terrible conditions, especially of garment workers, and she wanted to take that on. She wanted to take on industrialization. But how do women take on industrialization? See how they take on politics, social issues? By the late 19th century, women can take on industrialization as consumers. And Florence Kelly uh, and this woman here, Josephine Shaw Lowell, uh, begin to advance the idea that women can ameliorate the extraordinarily bad conditions of industrialization, the sweatshops, the terrible pay, uh, the terrible conditions, by refusing to buy products that are made in sweatshops. And they organize, eventually, in 1891, the National Consumers Leagues. And what they did is they, they would say, uh, we will not buy clothing or goods made under unsafe or unhealthy working conditions. And we demand as consumers, as mothers feeding our children, safe food and drink. We need to have the government guarantee these things for us by virtue of the fact we're consumers. Not by virtue of the fact that every human being should have a right to these things, but because we our wives and mothers, and we deserve to have good things ourselves, but we also must protect the other mothers who are out there producing these things. Well, if this is women taking on industrial society, um, I've really only talked about the East, the East, the North and the South here, but there is also the West. And the West is going to play a really important role for how women's roles play out in the late 19th century. This is not a woman on a horse. This is actually that stereotypical image of the cowboy coming out of 
the Civil War that I talked about with the um, movement of the cattle up the plains from 1866 onward. But what I didn't talk about when I talked about the cowboy was that by the 1870s, the image of the cowboy has a certain role for women, if you think about it. And this role has gotten picked up in Westerns ever since. Women are either good, stay-at-home, solid wives, or they're sort of criminals slash prostitutes in this Western image coming out of the Civil War. And that has to do with, as you know, the political image of the American cowboy. But those two images of women, either as very good or very bad, becomes crucial to the way women's images and women's role in American society develops after the war. But if that's the image of women with the cowboy, the reality of women in the West is very different. Uh, women work very hard in the West. They work in all the ways that they do in the East. They are homesteaders. They are farmers. Um, they work in factories. They work in, I'm sorry, in industries that are growing in the West. Basically, the employment patterns of the West for women replicate those of the East. Women work as servants when people can afford them. Um, they do laundry, especially in mining areas. They do all the things that they do back East, despite the image of the West, that women are essentially nuclear wives or prostitutes. Um, but there are, of course, I have to include this picture because it's fun. There are, of course, prostitutes in the West. And I like this picture especially because uh, of this, the liquor and the striped stockings. An image taken of striped stockings and liquor signifies that this is a picture of two uh, prostitutes. But this is not the only reality of the West for Western women. Yes, they're prostitutes. Yes, they're wives. But th for the most part, there's women doing everything that they did back East. Um, there's the old, that old um, saying that they, they had to do everything the men did um, and, and still take care of the kids at the same time. So the, the experiences of Western women have an image of being stay-at-home wives or, or fallen women, as they call them. But the reality is they're doing everything. Now, th although I just said that, because of that image of the cowboy, women really do push the idea, uh, and women writers and writers about the West push the idea very heavily in the late 19th century that good women, good American women, because the cowboy takes on such great power as a symbol of America after the Civil War. Good American women are housewives. They're in the home taking care of kids. And I put up Laura Ingalls Wilder here because she is actually born in 1867. She lives through this period. And she is probably our most influential Western writer. And, you know, I say that and you're thinking, Laura Ingalls Wilder, a Western writer? Her books have been in print since the 1930s. In my generation, everybody read them. And what's fascinating about them, she's from, uh, she's from a number of places, but she writes out of South Dakota. And what's fascinating about them is that she wrote them uh, in part because she so thoroughly hated the New Deal. But she develops in these books a very specific image of a Western woman and of an American woman. And that's somebody who follows a good man who stays at home, in the home, takes care of the kids, and is rewarded for that good behavior. Now, what's fascinating to me about that is that's not the life she lived. That's the life she wrote. In fact, at one point, the family lived above a saloon. In fact, she worked for other people. In fact, she makes most of her own money. In fact, Pa's kind of a loser. But that's not what she develops in these books. And that idea of, of women being in the home, taking their, their kids and being rewarded for that, really takes off in the late 19th and early 20th centuries. And the reason that I make such a big deal about this, looking back to the idea of who should have a say in American society, is what I'm suggesting is that by the 1880s, you get the rising idea that women are different and they should have a say in American society, not because everybody should have equal rights, end of discussion, the way people were talking about in 1866, but rather because they're wives and mothers. And again, yesterday I was reading the um, convention notes of the Idaho Constitutional Convention of 1889, and I found this and couldn't resist giving it to you. Because here in this convention, when they're talking about women's suffrage, Mr. King says, 
I am in favor of allowing the largest liberty to every citizen of the United States. Now, this is interesting because they have just blanket, without discussion, said Chinese and Indians can't vote, can't hold office, and can't uh, sit on juries. No discussion. They let that one through. But here he says, and I firmly believe that a majority of the women of this territory or in any state of the union are just as well qualified for the right of suffrage as the average man. And, and here you go. And there are thousands, tens of thousands, and hundreds of thousands of women, 10,000 times better qualified than one half of the men that vote in these United States. So what I'm setting up here is the idea that at the very moment that Americans are trying to figure out who should have a say in American society, they are cutting out, as you remember, African Americans with the idea that African Americans are corrupting the vote because they, they want handouts from the government. They're cutting out laborers because of the idea that organized labor also wants a handout from the government. They're not always even so sure about the robber barons because they're concerned that the robber barons are, the industrialists are, are switching the, um, the Congress and legislatures to, to unfairly benefit them. There's a lot of people, like Susan B. Anthony said, that maybe shouldn't have a say. Maybe race, shouldn't, race should be taken into consideration. Maybe class should be taken into consideration. Maybe education should be taken into consideration. But women are good wives and mothers. They're going to vote the right way, so long as they are wives and mothers. In 1890, the year after that, and that, mind you, there's not a direct correlation. I'm just giving you the line here. The National Women's Suffrage Association and the uh, American Women's Suffrage Association merge in 1890 to become the National American Women's Suffrage Association in 1890. And what they do is they focus on getting the suffrage. They focus on getting the vote. And this alienates uh, a number of the people who have been part of the National Women's Suffrage Association. And they make Susan B. Anthony uh, the, the, the um, president, the honorary president, as soon as it's organized. She's an, an, an elderly woman at this point, And she sails for Europe very shortly thereafter. It's clear that her moment has passed. And now the focus is going to be on the suffrage. But crucially, the idea of suffrage and women having a say in American society, by 1890, relies not on the idea that everybody should have equal rights, but rather that some people belong in American society because of the way they think or who they are. So I've talked about the rise of lynching after 1889 and the idea that Af certain African Americans should not participate in American society. I've talked about the government using um, the troops in uh, both Homestead and Pullman against, against strikers. Women aren't part of that. Women who want the suffrage insist that they should have the suffrage because they're good wives and mothers. They're going to clean up American society. They're not going to ask the government for any special favors. They're on the right team, if you will. And this is a powerful argument. So for example, the first woman elected to Congress from Montana in 1917 is uh, Jeanette Rangan. She's not the first to sit in Congress, by the way. You're going to hear about the first woman to sit in Congress uh, in a few weeks. Uh, but she's the first woman elected to Congress, and she was a member of this organization. This worked, the idea that people should get the vote because they are wives and mothers. And I want to argue that when women get the vote, when they begin to push this idea, they do it very deliberately. So after 1890, after the Mississippi Constitution I talked about, which restricted the vote um, based on education or poll taxes in the South, uh, the whole range of new constitutional conventions that write these new constitutions after 1890 in the South, but also in the North, there are a number of new constitutions that take the, the vote away from African American men, from poor men, from immigrants, at the very moment that women are getting the vote, which is really interesting. And women get the vote in part because they argue they will purify American society. They're not like those people trying to use the government for the wrong ends. They will use the government for good American families. And I love these images because women not only wear white when they're arguing for suffrage, 
but they also push their babies. Look at this image here of them dressed in white, pushing their babies. Not because they deserve to have equal rights, because everybody deserves to have equal rights, but because women must participate in an American society, but they must participate in a particular American society. It is no longer an American society based on the idea that every human being, by definition, should have a say in American society. It is now the idea of an American society in which certain people should have a say in American society because they are defending the idea of a nuclear family, of a government that is not beholden to any special interests, that in fact will advance that idea that we talked about from Lincoln through um, Horatio Alger on through the late 19th century, a middle class idea, if you will, an idea that the government should not respond to everybody, it should not be responding to those African Americans who've been read out of the country. It should not be responding to those organized laborers that many newspapers and thinkers accuse of trying to pervert American society. It should respond to a group of people who claim not to want special interests, who claim not to want any help from the government. And paradoxically, because they don't want anything from the government, they are the very ones who should control it. And of course, when they become the ones who can control it, they will control it for their own interests. It's this moment, it is the rise of an articulated look at how women should participate in American society that we crystallize in the late 19th century, the idea of an American middle class. Are there any questions about this? All right, let's pick it up on Thursday with um, the long day. Dorothy Richardson. Thanks for listening. Please rate, review, and subscribe to this podcast wherever you get your podcasts. We would love to hear from you. You can email us at podcasts at c-span.org. Thank you.